<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Amanda Sikafus and Mark Lewis with us today. Hello, Amanda. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi, Frank. Cool. Well, thank you so much for <clears throat> agreeing to talk about your very lovely article, which we'll get to soon. Uh, and Amanda, what's your what's your geolocation? I am located in beautiful and sunny Cape Town, South Africa. Ooh, all right. I think this is our first <laughs> video from Cape Town, South Africa. That's awesome. Very cool. So you doing some observing down there? Or? Uh, I live here. I live here really and work cool. here. And okay. I do a lot of observing down here, although okay. a lot of it is still remote, you know, just sure. like going around the world. Um, yeah. yeah, remote sure. observing locally and remote observing remotely. Nice. And Mark, what's your geolocation? I am in San Antonio, Texas, which is often sunny, but at the moment I'm in the clouds. Uh, um, yeah, I notice there's no snow on the ground behind you there. And we're no, in there's definitely no snow in San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> and it really only matters for the 8th of April, right? That's when the clouds have to get out of there. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. 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 We do have a, um, an eclipse coming up. Absolutely. In, indeed. I hope, I hope to attend. <laughs> Yeah, I should be in for the uh, AAS uh, High Energy Division meeting is in uh, around Austin. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm hopeful I will see it. So yes, the clouds have to go away on the 8th. Uh, very cool. And it is February 21st of 2024 as we record this. I'm in Phoenix and sort of like Texas, we don't get any snow on the ground. <laughs> so very cool. Um, and let's start with Mark. Mark, what do you like to do for research? Um, so... Uh... I have been a planetary ring simulator basically for, for my entire career. Cool. I kind of combine the planetary science and computer science. Um, and most of the work that I do is writing simulation codes and then running the simulations and doing the analysis on them. Right. Uh, I, I like to have lots and lots of small bodies in a computer bouncing off of each other. <laughs> Maybe sticking together, maybe not. We'll find out very soon here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Amanda, what do you like to do for research? Um, I consider myself an observational planetary astronomer. So mm -hmm. most of my work is definitely using ground-based telescopes and um, studying small bodies in the outer solar system. So uh, I, I specialize in a technique called stellar occultations. So we try and figure out when small bodies in the foreground like Pluto or, you know, Chiriklo that we're going to be talking about today pass in front of a distant star. And we can learn a lot about them, including constraining their sizes, measuring their atmospheres, all that kind of thing. But you have to be in exactly the right place at the right time. Right. So I end up kind of going all over the world to be at just the right place at just the right time to catch that elusive shadow and then um, use those data to try and learn more about those objects. Very cool. April 8th, there's a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> the closest star patient. we can possibly sure, have. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome planetary science journal article and it is open access we are in the open access era people you can go get a copy for free go grab one numerical simulations of 101.99 charlie goes rings with a resonant perturber and amanda and mark take us away all right well i i think i'll just start by giving a little bit of background on how we ended up working on this paper Mm -hmm. You may have heard <laughs> that there are minor planets in the solar system that have ring systems, but this is really, really new. So, I mean, just 10 years ago in 2014 was the first ring system discovered around a small body, and that would be around Chiriklo. Mm -hmm. And so in the past 10 years, people have been trying to figure out one, you know, how many of these objects have rings because they are fairly small and they're fairly far away. So Chiriklo is a centaur, mm -hmm. which means its orbit crosses that of the giant planets. We think it probably originated somewhere in the outer solar system and then was perturbed inward and it's on a chaotic orbit so most of the centaurs that we know within some millions of years are going to get either bounced out of the solar system or bounced in and hit the sun but they don't live there for very long okay. and so it's kind of a transitional area for mm -hmm. objects cool. and these objects as well it's kind of the, the centaur duality is kind of nice because some of them have been shown to be active so they outburst and then others are just kind of you know quiet and dull like asteroids so it's kind of this neat you know both dynamical characteristics and their physical characteristics nice. and Chiriklo is thought to be the biggest one at 250 kilometers in diameter so yes. it's not that big but it's the biggest of the centaurs mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And, and now we know that it has a two ring system Rings. and the, the yeah. observations that we've seen, and this is through the stellar occultations, that's how these rings were discovered. Mm -hmm. Watching a star go behind Shariklo, there was a little blip and a little blip, and then, you know, the nucleus blip, and then a little blip and a little blip, and enough places saw those blips all the way around Shariklo that they could actually put together that there was a two ring system. So two very thin rings at, as highlighted here, about 390 and 400 kilometers away from the center. Okay. And... <laughs> Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. This was this was brand new. And so Mark has been doing numerical simulations of Saturn's rings for a very long time. And we decided that we would like to try and apply the techniques that he was using to model the particles around Saturn's rings for the small body systems. Cool. So I said to Mark, can we can we do this? <laughs> and and I said, yes, I, I, I have to note that actually the uh, uh, I believe you know it was a similar approach that was used for discovering the Uranian rings, right? That yes, yes. It was a, yeah, Elliot, an occultation. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. this this mm -hmm. style of observing rings has does have a a long history. Uh, it's just no one was really expecting it to do anything for for small bodies like Chiriklo. Yeah, um, and you know one of the questions here is: turns rings don't stick around for very long uh, unless they the the material will tend to diffuse over time and and be lost and so we either have to believe that we are really special and seeing this you know we just got lucky and and happened to see this during the brief time that's here mm -hmm. or that but there do is we get lucky mechanism. how often do we get lucky <laughs> no and that's yeah we don't like to believe that we, we don't we don't think that <laughs> Uh, we, we might, come on, in come our on. hearts, we might think we're special, but you know, for the science part, we, we try not to say that. <laughs> we try not to say that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so then we need a confinement mechanism. And, and yeah. one of the things that I've been doing for a long time with Saturn is looking at the behavior of the material when there is a nearby perturber. So uh, a, a moon nearby that gives a kick to the bodies as they go, as they go by. And <laughs> what I found is if that kick is big enough, of uh, that it causes the collisions to happen in such a way that that the material doesn't spread and uh, okay. that happens fairly uniformly across all the the systems that i've looked at and so the question was could we get that effect here yeah so mark mark have you looked at what is it like the enki gap and and the f ring or did you do most of your modeling at the enki gap um it's it's been both of those and and even the keeler gap edge as well okay. uh, mm -hmm. And some situations where we just said, okay, let's throw down ring material. We're not actually looking at a particular system. We just want to see what would ring material do with, with a nearby perturber. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Cool. And so one of the questions that came up when we first started trying to get funding to work on this was, well, aren't these just like the large planets? And don't we already know a lot about the large planet ring systems? And so why is this so different? Why, sh why should you get funded to do special studies for the small bodies? Okay. And if you move down to that first table, this is yes. actually this this table started from a proposal that we wrote to get funded because we were trying to okay. show the reviewers that there are some similarities. You know, it's still okay. just physics. It's still just the dynamics of particles okay. moving around a body. But sure. there really are some interesting differences here. But yes. Uh yeah, there will be. I don't different. know, Mark, if you want to highlight anything that, I mean, that it's a lot. The, the velocities stood out to me. Yeah, the, the yeah. velocities were a big one. It's about an order of magnitude different speed. If you look at that orbital velocity thing around Chiriklo, the orbital speeds are at about 30 to 35. It's the third row down. Mm -hmm. They're at about 30 to 35 meters per second, oh, wow. where at, at Saturn, they're like kilometers a second. So it's a whole order of magnitude different in how fast the particles are going around the object. And you may expect something physical to be different when you reduce speeds by an order of magnitude. So yeah, okay. Well, you must have been successful. <laughs> eventually, eventually, eventually yes. Yes. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> Sometimes you have to bang. Um, yeah, and Mark, I don't know, synodic period. One of the reasons I think that we've been able to do this work is that things happen really quickly. Yeah, um, so I, I should note one of, the, one of the things that motivated this is while we are simulating a situation where there is a nearby moon, and it turns out a moon like the one we're simulating is, is below the detection level for current observations. So okay. it is possible such a moon exists, but these are also non- symmetric bodies and so there can be mass anomalies on them that also perturb the rings and in the case of of uh Chiriklo, 
there, there is the distinct possibility that the rotation period of Tariq Lo and the ring's orbital period, there is a mean motion resonance between that as well. And so uh, just exploring how the resonant forcing on these bodies impacts the, the rings is, is generally interesting as a potential confinement mechanism for ring material. Absolutely. Very cool. Good. So I guess we could look at a few of start going into the simulations, how, how things are set up. So the, the simulations that I tend to do, they are, um, they're in body with a large count for, uh, for the particles. Um, they do include collisions and the self-gravity of, of the particles. Um, Good. and, you know, just trying to be physically accurate for, for how these things would behave. Uh, and I'm generally using a small cell. So, so for example, the, the two rings here, the inner ring, and most of our simulations are just at the inner ring. The first set of figures will show both, okay. but the, the inner ring is seven kilometers across. And okay. in order to keep your particle counts reasonable, um, this what's these reasonable two, mark reasonable a few million <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so so reasonable is still large but but it turns out that if you want to simulate a billion particles these simulations would take years to to perform and so, so these are direct in body these are direct in body yeah. so so we are so in a cell cell being a box right yeah, you're yeah. not you're not doing here's the thing and everything's going around it you're yeah, doing here's yeah. a little cell that moves along there's the a cell and it drifts downstream and it has appropriate boundary conditions cool. to actually preserve the perturbation from a nearby moon yes so, okay. very um, cool and uh -huh. and then in in the figures we tend to string together a bunch of those snapshots to to make something that that shows the the full ring Okay, very cool. Uh, I'll ask a fun question. Listen, uh, code is parallel. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, what's a what's a what's a typical runtime for one of these simulations? We're talking minutes, hours, days, weeks. Oh, we're we're talking, we're talking weeks to months. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Good. And and this is why I was mentioning the synodic period, right, Mark? Because um, at least in this system, you have more passes of the moon over a shorter period of time. So we're oh. we're seeing things happen on the order of like decades at Chiriklo, nice. which you know, which doesn't take as much clock time or compute time as it would if you're at Saturn, because you know you have this much bigger system that the moon has to go all the way around to make another pass. Right. So things can happen much more quickly in this system. Luckily for us, which means we only have to run the simulations for weeks to months instead of over much longer time periods got it very cool yeah some some advantage of a short evolving system so yes relative yes. so amanda would you like to address so section you know 2.1 roche limit <sighs> being very significant here and so I, I think we should spend some time talking about that and that's that's definitely you have thought about this a lot yeah so actually if you scroll a little bit back up frank where you were <laughs> It's it's this first, so the Roche limit discussion is near and dear to my heart because um, there are now four minor planets that have been proposed to have ring systems. So Chiricla was the first, and then another large centaur named Chiron, which is a, roughly the same size, 200 kilometers in diameter-ish, so also one of the larger of the, of the centaurs. Thanks. But the occultation observations that we've taken most recently have shown that the material around it is kind of changing in position. So <laughs> there's... There's a lot of thinking that it's not just a stable two ring system, it's material that's kind of evolving on short time scales. And so something very interesting is going on at Chiron. Mm -hmm. And then there are two trans-Neptunian objects. So much, much farther out in the solar system, they're named Quoar and Haumea, and they're both much bigger. So thousands of kilometers, a thousand to, you know, multiple thousands of kilometers in size. So different kind of different things going on, but we now have four objects that have, have rings around them that are not giant planets. Nice. And, and Quoar in particular, the, the nature paper title was this big splash of, you know, it's outside of the Roche limit and it shouldn't be there. And But if you do the basic calculation of the Roche limit, where just in case people don't remember their, you know, astronomy 101, the Roche limit is basically the distance from the planet where if something is interior, the gravitational force is enough to pull it apart and it can be like ring particles. Yes. Whereas if it's farther away than that, it can stay accreted into a solid body. And if you have particles, they can accrete into a solid body because they're not getting yanked apart yes and 
And so it, it's not quite as simple as that simple equation shows you. You can you can break this down a little bit more, but it basically depends on the mass of the nucleus because that's how much gravitational pull the nucleus has. And it depends on the density of the object orbiting it because obviously more solid things are harder to pull apart and less dense things are easier to pull apart. Mm -hmm. But kind of no matter how you do this, it's very difficult to get the Roche limit at Chiriclo outside of the position of the rings. Okay. So, so the, or inside, I'm saying this wrong. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I apologize. I got you. Mm -hmm. So, so the, so I, I meant, yeah, it's, it's, it, this, this is always, you kind of go back and forth and you, in your mind, you're going, no, wait a minute. Right. So the ring should not exist because by all of these numbers, by normal values for the density and normal values that we think are the mass of the nucleus, this ring would be outside of the Roche limit, which means it shouldn't be pulled apart. It should be accreting into solid objects and we shouldn't yeah. see it on long time scales. Right. I'm so right. there may be, there may be a, a, phase space, you know, where the nucleus is more massive than we think. If we look at like the very upper end of the of the solutions that we have so far for the mass of Chiricla's nucleus, or if the particles are really not very dense, then then it kind of can get close. But but it's also coming up for all of these small bodies that hmm. it seems like huh. the, the rings are being located in places where we would not expect rings to exist. Interesting. And and that comes to, so we're going to talk a little later um, about us trying to track moonlets forming, because this is the part where we said, well, wait a minute, if it really is outside the Roche limit, we would expect the ring to be accreting. And so could we simulate ring particles that are accreting into clumps? Or would that not happen? Maybe this satellite that's perturbing the ring and confining it would also break the clumps apart. And that could explain why a ring could exist outside of the Roche limit, because the satellite not only confines it into a narrow space, but it also breaks it apart and stops it from accreting. I'm with you. So, so those are the, that's the two pronged investigation here was kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. one, can we confine the ring and two, what's, what's going on with the Roche limit and would there be accretion or not? Yes. So then if you go to the next table, Mark can kind of talk you through his thought process on the series of simulations that we ran to try and start investigating this. Yeah. Before doing that, I, I will note that we do have another example of a ring that is outside of the classical Roche limit that has stayed there for a while. And that's the F ring. So Saturn's Saturn ring Saturn. is outside of Saturn's Roche limit, but it has Prometheus and Pandora nearby it that are kicking it up and making the material. So it the, basically the collisions are happening at higher velocities and yeah. it's it's harder for things to reaccrete. So so the idea here is that maybe there's some similar type of process that's going on and preventing the rings at Chiriclo from from reaccreting. Okay. Um, so the the first thing to do in here was to figure out whether these simulations were really feasible, kind of explore the parameter space um, to, to see what the possibilities were. Because as, as people have probably gathered from this discussion, there's a lot that's not known about these centaurs, right? We don't have direct imaging. We're going off of occultations. You know, we don't know their densities. We don't know their masses. Uh, we know their sizes and we take guesses at a lot of other things. So, so the first step was to just kind of sample parameter space and see see what happens in in different simulations so we ran a number of simulations where we put the the moon at different locations we gave the moon different masses mm -hmm. we uh had different optical depths for for the ring and i should probably circle back around to that one in just a second uh gave the ring particles different sizes different densities um, and we did a few simulations early on where we did not include self-gravity just because they run a lot faster. So if you want to explore sure. what's going on in the system, you turn off gravity for a bit and uh, and and it goes a lot cool. faster. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think we knew we had something after Mark ran the first two. No, it's actually the second and the third. But if you if you scroll down to the first figure, yeah. when, when we don't have a moon in the system, we pretty quickly found that... Um, uh -huh. that the ring just doesn't stay. Yeah. There you it, go. it starts, we can see it even on short time scales, we see uh -huh. it diffusing, it, it spreads. The ring just yeah. uh, And that <laughs> happens both, both, both it, when there's no moon and if you're not in resonance with the moon. So yes. uh, yeah, so so we, in some ways you need something there that's going to, to do the confinement. Um, Note on optical depths and uh, and particle sizes. Yes. The, uh, you know, so the, the optical depth is actually one of the parameters that we know quite well, well, reasonably well for for the ring. There's still a fair bit of signal to noise issue on on this, but but 
you know, compared to many other parameters, it's one of the ones that we know a lot better. However, when you are However. simulating these things, <laughs> you often simulate them at a lower optical depth because the simulation is large collisional bodies. Yes. Whereas the actual optical depth is probably dust, right? Or or yes, smaller right. things, you know, marbles yeah. and tennis balls. And just because marbles and tennis balls, it takes a whole lot of tennis balls to cover a certain area. Um, mm -hmm. Takes a lot less beach balls and boulders. Uh, right. And so, <laughs> so for simulations, we typically aim for having an optical depth that's somewhat smaller. Also, because as soon as you turn on self-gravity, the optical depth isn't the parameter that drives the dynamics the most. It's the surface density. It's how much mass you have there, because that determines how much gravity holds things together. Yes. And... And, and one of the many, many, th I'm laughing because Mark and I have had so many discussions about optical depth. One of the many, many, many things we don't know about these ring systems is the size distribution. Yes. And, you know, normally you have, you know, kind of an exponential size distribution and, or power law at least, right? right. And you have so many more small, Little dusty things. type particles than the big ones. Right. And for, for most of our occultation data, they're in visible wavelengths. So you're most sensitive to, you know, micron and submicron sized particles, whereas yes. Mark can't possibly simulate mm -hmm. anything below like a meter. So we're talking, <laughs> you know, massive, massive bodies versus tiny, tiny dust. So mm -hmm. the, the model optical mm -hmm. depths are not to be confused with, you know, the actual observed yeah. ring optical depths. Right. Okay. But that's fine. Um, we're, we're exploring. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So. So I think, I think we're good on that table. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, in fact, if you, if you, I think then it figures, if you go to down to figure two, mm -hmm. that shows where Mark kind of explored two different resonances, putting the moon interior to the rings and putting the moon exterior to the rings. And now you can see rather than the ring width getting bigger and bigger, the rings are getting smaller. So they're being confined by this moon. Yes. yes. And, we got some and no, at this point, I was still, clips. we were still doing simulations that included both rings because that is, because there are two rings there. So this is actually a, a potential significant constraint on this. And the question is, can you find a location where both rings are in resonance and therefore both of them would be combined by a single body? It's a much easier, Okay. it's a much nicer assumption to only have one moon giving you both perturbations as opposed to requiring multiple moons for, for doing this. More knobs. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. yep. And, and this one on the bottom, this six to five one, those rings are in roughly the same locations as they have been observed. So it, yes. it nicely matches the, the observations. And they're both in, in uh, mean motion resonance with the moon. Yes. And that sort of correlates with sort of the topology of the orbital shapes here, right? You got a three, four, it's kind of a four oh. figure. This one's kind of a six sided figure. And and since Amanda mentioned it, uh, it wasn't for Chiriclo, uh, but the, the idea of material moving in and out and not always being at the same location, uh -huh. you can just look at this figure here and see that that, that is something, the, the, the high density material is not always at the same distance from, from the central body. Uh, yeah. because of that, the structures that are formed by the resonant interactions. Yep. Cool. Very cool. As methyl variations. Yeah. yeah. So those we should be able to detect in the occultation data. And we do see kind of one to two kilometer variations in ring width as you go, as you take slices of the star yes. going through the system. Okay. You want to say something Mark, about- do you, wanna, little... do you want to, sorry, do you want to say something about those little blips? Yeah. yeah because that's where I was going. These little blips. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, the little blips Very in Very periodic there. looking little blips. The, the way that this data is collected is binning up the, the values in the simulations. Mm -hmm. And so the, the little blips occur because our bins are at fixed locations. This is really an artifact of those bins, whether as the particles are moving in and out, because they are moving in and out, they will spill over into one bin or uh, not. But the width is calculated from the bend values. And yes. therefore, every so often, a part of, you know, some particles move move into a new bin and a little blip on it. Gotcha. OK, cool. Very good. Those are those two. So right. I don't know about you, Mark. I, I like the figures to tell the story. And, and it's easier, right, for us to be sitting here talking about figures. And I think yeah. I think our figures pretty much talk us through it. So if we go to the next figure, okay. this is basically we then left the moon at that five to six, six to five mean motion resonance. 
and mm -hmm. then changed changed both the optical depths of the ring material and then changed the mass of the moon just to see what would happen. So this is again how, you know, basically a, an example of how wide the ring is as a function of on the left, uh, more material in the ring and on the right, less material in the ring. Those are optical yes. depths. Yes. And then from top to bottom, a less massive moon and a more massive moon. And, and basically yes. you need a certain moon mass in order to confine the rings. If, if the moon... Yeah. If the moon's too small, it doesn't give a big enough kick, and it doesn't yep. cause this organized motion that that cool. uh, you know what the reverses the angular momentum flux, uh, causes the particles to basically cool. move towards higher densities instead of the normal diffusion process of moving away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. but and if you get a big and if you go moon in there, and it works really well. Yeah, and in fact, if you look at like the the lower left, no, the lower right plot, looking at the same mm -hmm. screen, the lower right plot, mm -hmm. if you have if you have too big of a moon and too little material, you actually get rings that are even thinner than the ones that we see. Yes. So there's some some happy yes. space, and so yeah. so that you know what we say is that middle plot on the right is kind of the happy space where yes. a moon that's about three times ten to the thirteen kilograms can produce a, a ring that's about the same size as that that's observed. So so this mechanism works. Cool. Very good. And, um, and yeah, and if you go down just a little bit further, there's another plot where we kind of put this into, a, you know, a, the one on the right, plot number five. Okay. We're exploring this, the phase space a little bit more where we, you know, flushed out more optical depths, more satellite masses, and then plotted them. And we get a roughly, as you might expect, a roughly linear correlation between how massive your moon is, how much material you have, and whether or not it's confined. So... Yeah. And, so, and the, so we end up kind of having this this phase space of like if the ring is has less material or and the satellite has less mass, you're never going to get a confined ring. But if you're up above, if you're up to the the upper left of that kind of uh -huh. grayish line, uh -huh. then we can actually get a confined ring with one satellite. And what is the difference between uh, dots with black circles in the middle and ones without? So the the black circle in the middle means that it was confined. So this was what, looking at the simulation. Did we actually keep the material or was it spreading out? And mm -hmm. so lower right, mm -hmm. that material is, was was not confined by the moon. And and of course, the higher your optical depth, the more collisions you have, the greater the diffusion. And so you need a bigger moon in order to do it. Got it. If I actually just read the plot, it was right here with the daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. But all of those are above this line or this band, yeah. they will say. So that's, which, that's right. Which makes sense. Okay. Cool. So, so yeah, we just drew that line as like an, an indicator bias. It's not perfect, but you know, more or less, if you, you know, yeah. if you know your optical depths, you can say you need this much mass to kind of to cause confine. the ring to be confined this far. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good. Um, and that's, that's what leads us to one of the conclusions of the paper, which is, you know, a satellite that has, you know, roughly three times 10 to the 13th kilograms of mass is sufficient to confine the rings that we see. Cool. Okay. And that translates to what was it, Mark, about three kilometers in... I believe diameter? so. Diameter, yeah. three kilometers yeah. in diameter. It's a, it's in the conclusions. I'll just look quickly. Um, Depends on the density. Of the oh yeah, we say a few, a, 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 a few kilometers in in okay. diameter. That um, so that's how we know that this would be too small for us to directly image. So people have tried, you know, pointing Hubble at Chiriclo and looking yeah. to see if there are any moons. But this is so close and it's so small compared to Chiriclo itself that you you just can't detect it directly yet. Okay. And even even things like Alma, we've we've thought about you know trying different wavelengths, dude, but it's dude. just too small to to actually be able to detect it with Chiriclo right next to it. Time for a mission. Exactly. <laughs> your, your lips to uh, to NASA's <laughs> NASA's gods. I don't know. Well, we're doing psyche, you know. We ought to do something a little closer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what we want. We, I mean, you, we we've. Um, We've, there have been proposals for missions to centaurs um, for for the past few years, and and everybody thinks they're very compelling targets. So yeah, yeah. Sharika is. I'm just going to say list. that you could you don't even have to have a special mission to it. If, for example, something going to Uranus decided to fly nearby, right? Yeah, um, I you would just take a plan it right on the on the route out there. You could get some pictures of some stuff that you wanted to see. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Which would give you visual, it give you the mass, good approximate approximation of the mass. Yeah. Yep. Be very nice. Exactly. And we could see that maybe it has a whole system of moons. Who knows? Or maybe it has know. none. I don't know. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it has four, you know, maybe maybe it's as complicated as Saturn, you know? We just don't see it yet. 
<laughs> and, and this is one of the mysteries. So of the objects that are proposed to have rings, the, the small bodies, Quoar yeah, is known to have a small moon. Uh, Haumea has a whole system. It, it got, yeah. it, 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 there's a known collision, it has a whole collisional family of other objects that have gone off onto their own orbits and it has, um, but you know, Chiron, nothing, Chiriklo, nothing. We just don't know. And, and that gets back to like, how are the rings even formed? So here we're focusing on confinement. But one of the questions is, you know, does it take an impact? And then that impact kind of coalesces into a ring system. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then you could have other moons or, you know, is, is that not part of it? Could it be outgassing for the no, centaurs? Yes. Could they just be ejecting yes. material? Yes. Um, and and again, for the centaurs, they come from the outer solar system. So maybe objects like Poar and Haumea, maybe Chiriklo and Chiron had rings or things that formed way out there. And then they kept the rings as they moved in. Out. Because th there are questions about, you know, how difficult would it be to perturb those rings Ooh, if they are yes. passing, if the centaurs pass close to giant planets, could the ring material be pulled off? But yes. the simulations have shown that they don't often pass near giant planets. And even if they did, it wouldn't be enough to actually perturb the material. So it could be that, you know, the rings form out in the outer solar system. And then these are just a couple of the objects that have come in with them already. So mm. we don't even know like where they formed or how they formed or, you know, it's, it's really such a new area of research. That's nice. Very nice. Cool. Yeah. So, so when we got to this point, I think Mark and I were like, okay, cool. We have a, we have a good result, right? We can, we can yeah. actually yeah. cause, cause the rings as we see them to be confined over a relatively mm. short period of time. Mm. This all makes good sense. Um, but then Mark started thinking about the actual properties of the particles that we were working with. Yes. And if you go down to that next figure, this shows you mm. the, the cells. These are examples of his lovely. simulation cells. Lovely, lovely. Okay, what do we got here? And That's this good. is, these mm. were simulations. Yes. So we mentioned earlier the fact that we are outside of the Roche limit. And so there's this question of should material be accreting here? And yeah. what impact does the perturbation from from the uh, the you know, moon so, have yeah. on that process. Yes. Uh, and to explore this, I ran simulations that had two different approaches to handling collisions. So mm -hmm. the the panel on the far left is labeled hard sphere. So mm -hmm. that's the that is the method that is used through most of this paper. These right. are um, it uses what's called a discrete event style simulation. The particles have you know, an instantaneous collision and then push off uh, from each other. Mm -hmm. The It's a velocity dependent coefficient of restitution. So how much energy you lose depends upon how fast you're moving. Yeah. Um, whereas yes. the the other two panels here, and this was, we only use this approach for, for this part of the work, use a soft sphere. And this is where you allow the particles to interpenetrate and have a restoring force that winds up generally not being velocity dependent dependent you're 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 aiming for having a particular coefficient of restitution in this case yes. 0.5 okay. uh, so that they come off with half the velocity that they that they enter the collision mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and in this case they were actually very very soft particles they they were uh you know in some ways almost sticky because they they right. allowed they were able to interpenetrate quite a bit and these two approaches to doing the simulation came up with very different results. So, so the hard mm -hmm. sphere, we see no accretion of small bodies. So, so I should note that what we're looking at here was trying to track the formation of moonlets, the mm -hmm. formation of small bodies, chunks of material that are gravitationally bound and see how well they survive over time. And in that hard sphere solution uh, or simulation, I never had a a moonlet form that lasted more than uh, an orbit. Okay, so, okay, sure. so they might form briefly, and and it should be noted. And this is where one of the problems with with papers is I can't put movies in them. Um, but but <laughs> these these systems right here, <laughs> these not yet. Right, <laughs> Uh, these systems right here are very dynamic. The the high density line that you see going through the middle of the the leftmost and the middle plots, that is yes. actually the the perturbation from from the uh, the resonance, and it it propagates from the right side of the panel to the left, oh, and oh. every orbit it goes across the entire panel. Oh. Um, uh, and and so you you get this very high density region where particles are able to clump together more, but then yeah. they fall out of it, and that's where you get that stringiness that you see coming off 
to the on the on the uh, right side of that line is the mm -hmm. stringiness of the material getting as it falls out. The structures that are on the left side of the line are more the natural gravity wakes. These are the clump, yeah. the, the yeah. ephemeral clumps that form because self gravity holds stuff together. Uh -huh. But note, like their cant angle and whatnot changes because of the perturbation from the from the moon from that resonant That's perturbation around. Yes, yes. Um, but in the soft sphere, because they were so much, uh, the 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 collisions are are more dissipative, um, and yeah. the particles are able to interpenetrate more. We actually did form moonlets, so the material did start to reaccrete, yeah. and at least. At least for these simulations, the yep. my analogy is we got to what's called the oligarchic growth phase. So when you look at the you know the models of of how we form terrestrial planets, a lot of times the simulations ran into this situation where okay we formed a bunch of moons and then they just go around and start destroying each other. Um, mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what's happening here is a large fraction of the material got confined into uh, twenty thirty moonlets okay then but and i but think if they, you go you're now kind of talking about figure 10 if you want to scroll down to figure 10 that's where we show like the number of moonlets over time and you can ooh. see what mark's talking yeah. about that Oops. everything kind of ends up accreting into just a finite number of of moonlets uh, yes yeah. so, it's the most boring plot that one yeah just yeah, the well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah so, so, hard. yeah perfect so moonlit count, and as I said, we're in the 20 to 30 range for our number of moonlets there. When we hit, like what I, what I like to describe is that oligarchic phase. We just have, we have a, a set of oligarchs out there, but you can see the the number of particles in them is is huge. We're approaching the million particle um, mm, yes. in that simulation. So everything's getting swept up into those moonlets. Yeah, yeah. yes. But, but they're not reaccreting and and I you know as as with the terrestrial planet formation, the time scales for running your simulation to figure out how long they take to run into each other uh, becomes very large. Like they're the the odds of collisions between these bodies is is now a low probability event. Um, and and that was kind of beyond what we could do in in these simulations. The interesting thing to take from this, though, is whether, the being outside of the classical Roche limit matters for reaccretion depends significantly on the collisional properties of the particles. Yes. Uh, and and so we have examples of very soft, squishy particles that reaccrete, and probably this ring wouldn't wouldn't be there for very long in that scenario. Or if you have harder particles that that don't stick together as well and that that are more bouncy then then yeah the ring's going to stay there and not reaccrete right and even in these hard sphere you sort of get this like periodicness of yes um, so you know, so you when you form that, you break you form you break <laughs> so yeah. one of the things i didn't i didn't mention the the uh initial distribution of particles was not yeah. uniform across uh radius it was a gaussian um in okay. radius so okay. so there's a high density region in the middle that falls off to either side Yes. And what you're seeing there is when that when that wake structure goes across the high density region, a few small moonlets fall out of it. Yes. But then anything that runs into them causes them to abrupt and they fall apart. Right. Ballistically blasted. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And and the plots that you kind of kind of rolled over there that are that are back up and like talk through some of showing the, the glops with the colors. This is Mark's moonlet tracking um, images. You can pick any one of those that we can just talk let's about, see, I think. Um, Mark the... had to actually come up with some fancy code. We spent quite a while talking about how yeah. do you track a moonlet? How do you know what is a moonlet when you're doing a ring simulation? Yeah, we, we spent a fair bit of time playing with this. And what, what wound up happening, so this code is, is finding clumps of particles that are gravitationally bound. So I keep adding in more particles as long as the potential energy of that particle is less than the, the relative kinetic energy. Okay. Uh, so, so assuming that it's gravitationally bound to the other particles that are in there, and those are what the little colored blobs are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And and it is it is hard to see, but yes, thank you. You, you, you saw it right there. So well, there's, I saw it right here. 
on the other side. There from, you go. Yeah. You zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little, little yellow. And you can see how it just kind of, yeah. it, it is part of one of these clumps that fell out of the wake as the wake. So the wake was still moving from right to left across this. And yes. the material falls out in this stringy nature, but every so often you'd get a clump that was gravitationally bound, at least for a while. Mm -hmm. Yes, transient. Mm -hmm. And in the hard sphere, though, they don't stay that way. Yeah. But if you scroll down, we have some frames from the soft Ooh. sphere, Ooh. where I got to use more colors because we yeah. have more colors. <laughs> um, well, different yeah. colored rings, right? <laughs> the colors are beautiful. I, I just picked from a, a palette of colorblind mm -hmm. friendly colors. So mm -hmm. well done, Mark. Well done. Good for yeah. you. Good for you. Um, because all, all they're the only thing they're intended to do is allow you to differentiate them over on the. Yeah. The so right so when you zoom in on the right side, yeah, you can pick yeah. out which one matches. Yeah. yeah it's a little right. bit hard, but with the zooming capability, it works. <laughs> yeah. oh, very good. Yeah, we'll just zoom in on one just for fun. Uh, but there's two of them right there. There's our orangey. And, and, our and so this one is kind of earlier on in the soft sphere. So they're still yes. looking a little bit ragged. They've still yeah. got material accreting or falling apart. And then that next figure, they're much, it's like what, four or five orbits later and it's much cleaner. They're, they're much nicer oh, and more yeah. separated. Oh, and definitely. So it's when, love... when most of the material is now accreted. Very and cool. these figures were made yeah. with the nine largest moonlets um as opposed to because as as we saw from the counts in the next in the figure that's down below we got up to like 50 moonlets at one point and and you can see all the black dots there on the right that weren't yeah weren't colored yeah yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very cool very cool yeah so, so mark are you going to do moonlit tracking now for saturn's rings or are you going to keep this for small well, bodies you've got well, a capability so, there so you know i the code right. is Right, the code can be used on on whatever ring simulation I I decide to do at this point. Um, I'll come back yeah. to that. I'll come the, back. <laughs> so it it will be useful for for the future. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Well, and I think that just leaves us with the famous rainbow plots, which which oh. we only actually put in during the paper revision because they're very very pretty, but they're very confusing. <laughs> and. Okay, so let's, let's try this one. Let's try eleven. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll try the rainbow plots here. Okay, so, okay. so first off, the rainbow plots are something that I use for my in my data analysis to to see the different values because they give me a lot more information uh, about what's what's going on. So in this mm -hmm. case, we are seeing so there there are three different values we have. Uh, okay, so let's oh, which is the easiest? Um. Let's go with eccentricity. None of uh, them. <laughs> none of them. No, let's go with the forced eccentricity. Here we go. Yeah, the forced okay. uh, eccentricity there. And that is plotted in the Cartesian space. So, so you see the pattern that is being caused by the resonant forcing in there, the, the red. Yes. It's in there. See the... You have these particles that, and it's kind of making a box, right? Yeah. That is... Yeah. That is the the material that is at a higher forced eccentricity from the interactions with the moon. By the way, the black circle in there is the location of the resonance itself. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Now that is, I mentioned that is the Cartesian locations of the, for a lot of the analysis, mm -hmm. we actually use what are referred to as guiding center coordinates. And this is, so basically tracking the semi-major axis and the mean anomaly as opposed to the actual location in there. Yes. And so the figure on the far right, it's tau, it's an optical depth, but it's the optical depth in the guiding center coordinate. So basically bend by semi-major axis, not yeah. bend by actual location. Yeah. And so that, that square type structure goes away because the semi-major axis stays the same the whole way around. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows you where the particle high density region is, which is actually just inside of the resonant location uh, yeah. in this. Okay. And, and, and the, I'll note, because we talked about this quite a bit. So in this yes. case, what the moon is interior to the ring. Yes. yes. And so the material is located slightly closer to the ring or closer to the moon than the resonance. Mm -hmm. If you put the moon exterior to the ring, it right. would be just the opposite. More of the material would fall outside of that resonance line. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Okay. Got and 
last plot is is it's the epicyclic phase. Uh, you can think of it as as a mean anomaly if if you mm. like orbital. Uh, no, the 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 one the, with, the one on the right or the left left five <laughs> the one on the far left of that yeah, one yeah that, the the <laughs> five there is is a uh, the epicyclic phase that's just showing you how the particles are kind of progressing through their orbit going around and once again we're in a uh, the ring has is completing four orbits for each pass by the moon. And so you get that structure where mm -hmm. the, the rainbow is repeated four oh, times. Yes. Going going through yes. here. Quad um, symmetry. Quad symmetry. Thing to note about this, and part of the reason we did this is we wanted to emphasize the fact the real ring is almost certainly a somewhat eccentric ring. It's very hard to ever have a perfectly circular ring um, unless you're running simulations. And yeah. it turns out it's much easier to simulate circular rings than it is to <laughs> simulate eccentric rings. Um, and and so I, this is part of part of the point of this was after talking with the reviewers and going through things, showing we are doing circular rings, and the reason this matters. So we mentioned earlier that the perturbation we're simulating a moon, but this could be a mass anomaly on Chiriklo itself, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That is a the resonance there is a three to one mean motion resonance. So, okay. Okay. Um, and spin, it, spin orbit. Spin, spin orbit, orbit yeah. resonance. So, yeah. uh, a three to one spin orbit resonance where um, the yeah. thing is that the three to one, all of these are an M to M plus one type of resonance where the, the difference between your two values is off by one, which means you always see the, the perturber once per orbit at the same location. Mm -hmm. uh, three to one, because of that difference of two, it turns out you see it at two different locations. And if your ring is perfectly circular, they cancel each other out. Yes. And so it turns out we can't simulate with with this with the setup that's here. We can't simulate the three to one spin orbit resonance because it it winds up not having a growth in eccentricity. The eccentricity gets big for a bit, but then it gets kicked back down, and it just goes back and forth as opposed to building up over time, which is what we see in these simulations. So cool. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And and on that note, I was going to say the the other point to take away. Right, we we're only modeling circular rings. We can't do eccentric rings. We also our our nucleus is a point mass. Yes. So so the this idea of having a mass anomaly and the work that's been done for a non axisymmetric nucleus in the spin orbit resonance, we just have a mass. We do not have any you know spherical or elongated. We know that Chiriklo is more like a triaxial ellipsoid rather mm -hmm. than being a sphere. But for us, it, it doesn't matter. It's just a mass. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For now. So these are all areas for of now. future work, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. For now, we'll come back to that. The, the, the future work yep. section can be quite extensive. It's massive. It's massive. Oh, yeah. Oh, we'll cover that. All right. But, well, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's pretty much it. That last <laughs> plot is basically the rainbow plot you were just looking at, but rather than being projected ah. into a circle like the rings, it's just over time. So this yeah. is how Mark likes to look at them, but most normal <laughs> people like to see them in a, in a ring shape. <laughs> and, and of course, one advantage <laughs> of this is it actually shows the evolution over the entire simulation from zero on the left all the way through, whereas <laughs> the reprojection only shows you the last synodic period. Okay. So, that tiny little okay. bit at the end on the right, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> The last four wiggles on the right there, we reprojected that to the circle. Correct. Whereas this allows you to see how the entire system has evolved. evolved. Correct. Correct. There was something there about Mark being normal or not normal because he likes these. I oh, know. <laughs> yeah, no, we've, it, it, I mean, the roller skates alone pushed him well past that long ago. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very cool. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Nice work. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. And that is going to take us through. And Amanda and Mark, I want to thank you once again for walking through this very awesome PSJ article on Chirlico's rings. Nice. Thank you for listening sure. and sure. hopefully understanding. Oh, I got it. I'm with it. I followed. Yeah, very good. Um, so um you mentioned it a couple of times, or you left some some ends out there a little bit. Um, so let me let me push on it a little bit. Uh, and where do you think we go from here, given given the published article? Is there more physics that could be done, put into for the coefficient of restitution? Are there other ring systems that this could be applied to? Um, and so on. Just sort of next steps on where we go with this. And 
let you go. Did you want to open this one, Amanda? Oh, you yeah, can Amanda. start, Mark. Please, okay, I'll, please. Mark, please. Start. I'll, I'll um, kick it to Mark first. So, so actually, there, there, are, there are a variety of different directions that we're taking this right now. So some of it is um, new upgrades to the numerical code and trying to do a better job of having more control over the coefficient of restitution. So yes. I have I have a set of little research minions who are working on trying to create an enhanced version of the code that that I we will be able to do soft sphere, but have kind of fine grain control over that coefficient of restitution. So they're not so squishy. And uh, and just comparing that to hard sphere will be an interesting project. But that will allow us to to explore more the moonlit formation and what physical properties of the of the rings will will how they impact that, which would tell us something about what the particles are there because the ring we see the ring, so clearly it's not reaccreting. Yeah. Um, so we'd we'd get some information about about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm also trying to work on eccentric rings. Um, there, yeah, th there are aspects of the current code that that we use a, a we use a linearized solution to the Hills equation, yes. which does not like eccentric rings, and so so I've been exploring that as well. So that's an, another direction, and that would allow us to start looking at the spin orbit resonance that we haven't yes. been able to do so far. Cool. Right. And the work that's been done on the spin orbit resonance, it's really great. I mean, it's really interesting. And this is, you know, the reviewers kept kind of going, well, why don't you model that? Yeah. The the publications on that have, have numerical modeling. It's just at a much lower resolution, you know, many fewer particles and it's, you know, doing a whole system. So they've kind of initially showed, but the stuff Mark does, I mean, I think you're one of the only people that does this, right? At such high resolution that you can see like all these streamers and the movements yeah, and the, the, really the gory cool. detail yeah. of these millions of particles that, that are going and, around, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say the, the work that I'm doing right now is starting off with that lower resolution. So um, I, I actually just killed a simulation because it wasn't behaving properly, but it was it was a global simulation. So it goes all the way around Yes, but it needed 33 million particles, and I had to make my particles 10 times larger than what they would normally be. So I don't, I wouldn't have the same level of resolution. I wouldn't be able to see the the dynamics at quite the same same level. Yes, but it could be eccentric, and so so this is that that's a whole other area to explore how to how to potentially do an eccentric ring, and then even better if we can figure out how to do an eccentric ring with a uh with high resolution yes mm -hmm. cool and one of the big things on my to-do list i mean we can definitely try and apply this to other systems i mean we were just talking about you know the four different ones that are out there then i mean chiron is kind of a natural one but we don't think there's a stable material so mm -hmm. i think chiron's going to get pushed until we get more occultation observations um but quoar is an interesting one that one looks like a, the ring might be in a six to one rotational resonance so mm -hmm. again could it be a spin orbit and we know quoar has a little moon named waywat if there's one moon maybe there are more moons so quoar might be a natural fit it's a larger object a thousand some kilometers but um uh, fairly spherical i think in shape so um there, okay. there may be room there that that it applies one of the big things that we struggle with is how do we compare the occultation data, which are the ground truth we have for the physical properties of the objects with the model results. So we've Fair talked enough. a little bit Fair about enough. the optical depth problem. Mm -hmm. And so Mark and I are talking more and more about how, how do we better compare, you know, what can, can we take a slice from Mark's model and simulate what that would look like for an occultation, a ground-based occultation in visible wavelengths. Yes. yes. And, and what do you have to know about particle sizes or what assumptions do you have to make about particle sizes or various things to kind of match those? And Mark has done some of this with Cassini. So he's worked on stellar occultations from Cassini, but of course, you know, Cassini was right there and here are the rings and here's the, yeah, <laughs> the you distant stars. Front row, front row view. <laughs> front row view. And, you know, we know a lot more about what's going on at Saturn. Um, so we have some experience. It's just, we have to kind of now apply that to this whole different regime. Yeah. So creating these synthetic observations, which kind synthetic of close the loop and give you yes. what would an observation be yes. on the simulated data. Yeah. And how, how then can we better use the little occultation data that we have to constrain the models and then, you know, get down to what the real physical parameters are. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'm really. That's our goal. We're going to solve everything. Yeah, you're going to, well, <laughs> ambition is a good thing. Ambition is good. <laughs> So, no, I mean, I really look forward to seeing this develop over the next couple of years. I think it'd be very exciting um, stuff. So, well, thank you. Yeah, it'd be great.
Yeah. And I'm going to keep trying to run around the world taking data so Mark can model. Awesome. awesome. I, I keep asking for better pictures, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on to, it. You have I'm to make better it. pictures <laughs> currently. currently. <laughs> very cool. Amanda and Mark, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your awesome article. Thank you very much. Fred. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. It's nice sure. to be here. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.